yesterday, it went on with crime and crime intervention and prevention. All of these really can be summed up under protecting our human capital, protecting our health, protecting our future through education, and protecting our physical beings and our property. Now, I'm Theodore Henry. Thank you for joining us. Uh, this stream, of course, is courtesy of the Jamaica Information Service. If you're watching on YouTube, don't forget to share. Like the stream as well. If you're watching on Facebook, like and share with your friends so that they too can participate in the Diaspora Conference, especially on Twitter, which we are also streaming on. Don't forget to share to hashtag Jamaica55 or hashtag Diaspora Conference. Now, there is an impressive program lined up for today, and it begins with the Diaspora Growth Forum. That session will discuss innovative strategies for the inclusive economic growth and job creation in Jamaica. And these plans are laid out by what we call the Economic Growth Council, or EGC, which envisions a stable, growing economy with ever-reducing debt. That is a crucial part of it, a thriving business sector, and a public sector that facilitates investments. The theme of the conference, as I mentioned prior, is partnering for growth. So, of course, the diaspora is integral to this growth and the achievement of these objectives of the Economic Growth Council. We will hear from Minister Without Portfolio in the Ministry of Economic Growth and Job Creation, the Honorable Darrell Vaz. There will also be the Chairman of the National Growth Council, the Honorable Michael Leachin speaking, and the Chairman of the Diaspora Economic Growth Council Task Force, Dr. David Panton. Now, since the opening of the event on Sunday, we have been hearing about the value of the diaspora to Jamaica, you know, and Miss Shanique Smart, who is a research officer of the Caribbean Policy Research Institute, otherwise called Capri, will reveal some findings of a diaspora valuation study. So we want to quantify what the, um, the buy-in is, you know, and you can add your comments to that of the delegates as they respond to the presentation. We're on the social media networks. Don't don't be shy with your comments. We will try to answer as best as possible. The conference is about to start and you can see the people are networking, meeting, greeting, and in a few minutes, I'm sure we'll be going live from the main podium. But at about 10.30, there will be presentations on future strategies for expanding the outsourcing sector. Another will be building Jamaica as a key global logistics hub and strategies for attracting global investors. And the final one I have here on my list is building a workforce for future growth and development. This will be followed by a roundtable discussion on diaspora investment. After our final plenary session yesterday on security, crime intervention and prevention, we had that roundtable session that was promised to be for the groups, the USA groups, the Canadian groups, the United Kingdom groups. And I'm sure we'll hear about some of the results of the things that they discussed yesterday, today. Now, you also, once again, you can join the discussion on social media and uh, to learn more about diaspora success in Jamaica from members of the diaspora, not just um, from the presenters, but the actual members and these people who have returned to and invested in Jamaica and are running successful businesses. We know that a lot of members of the diaspora are interested in this sort of thing. Uh, how do you get reintegrated into this little place that we call home? Several of the questions yesterday, especially in the final plenary session, focused on giving back, using the skill sets, knowledge transfer, technology transfer, bringing things into the country that can help the communities that we are from and also Jamaica as a whole in the areas of health, education and crime intervention and prevention. Of course, the marketplace. We have mentioned the marketplace several times yesterday. It is still up and the delegates will have further opportunities to network, use the one-stop shop government services and the business sector services. We have PICA, that is the Passport Immigration Authority. We have the RGD, the Registrar General's Department, the Companies Office of Jamaica, the National Housing Trust is also here among many others. So feel free. If you are nearby and you're watching this stream, you're nearby the Jamaica Conference Center, downtown Kingston, feel free to come and be a part of the marketplace. Come and see what is there to on offer. Take advantage of many of the one-stop services. You know, it's, it's not exclusive like that. You can join us. Now, as we see the Ladies presenters and gentlemen, could you be seated, please? are now here, the opening the is about to begin, session. and I will sign off. Once again, I'm Theodore Henry. This is the Jamaica Information Service, and we thank you for joining us on the live stream. Please stay with us throughout day two of the Jamaica 55 Diaspora Conference.
Ready? Okay. Uh, good morning again, everyone. Let me welcome you to this session. The central feature of this year's conference is the growth agenda. And this morning's session will be led by the Economic Growth Council. The session is sponsored by Jamaica National Group. And I have great pleasure at this time to hand over to your moderator for the morning session, Mr. Earl Jarrett, who is also chairman of the Jamaica Diaspora Foundation. Earl. Thank you. Thank you, Neville. Good morning, everyone. Great to see you this morning. I see some people can't wake up having had too much to eat and be entertained last night, but I'm certain as the, as the session progresses, we will see the attendance increasing. This morning's presentation is the centerpiece of our conference. As you know, and as we said on Sunday, the Jamaican people have been restless for growth for many, many years. That restlessness goes back to 1850, when the first set of Jamaicans left to build the Panama Canal and to build the, the railway in Panama. That restlessness took us to the United States, took us to the United Kingdom, took us all over the world, Dubai, Japan, as we all push for personal growth, for financial growth, for economic growth. This morning, we're going to address the issue of growth. And we have a distinguished panel of persons who are experts in the area, people who themselves have grown significantly over time. We have with us the Honorable Daryl Vaz, who is going to open the session this morning. And that, the Honorable Daryl Vaz is a minister, with, is a minister without portfolio in the Ministry of Economic Growth and Job Creation with responsibility for land, environment, climate change, and investment portfolios. So this is a man with a clear responsibility for controlling those key ingredients to growth. Daryl, of course, is a businessman. He has experienced business in Jamaica. He has grown his own business. He has, he has built it over the years. He's a member of parliament for Western Portland, a seat that he has retained for many years and which in, in which he himself has sought to achieve growth for the communities within that, for the persons within that constituency. At the center of our presentation this morning is, Mr. Mike, is the Honorable Dr. Michael Leachin. Dr. Michael Leachin is the chairman of Portland Holdings. Michael Leachin is widely regarded as a visionary entrepreneur whose philosophy is doing well and doing good. He has created extraordinary businesses and has achieved significant business success internationally, and he has also been a great philanthropist. Michael's business spans many countries in, in a diverse set of areas. Portland Holdings 
expanded internationally with the acquisition of National Commercial Bank in 2002. That bank today is Jamaica's largest bank with many branches and a, and, and a reach in many countries outside of Jamaica. In 2007, Michael Leachin and his Portland private equity team launched the largest private equity fund in the Caribbean. And based on its, its success, followed up with a fund two thereafter. Michael has achieved many, many personal accomplishments. He has received honorary doctorates from many universities. But his greatest achievement is that he's from Portland. His greatest achievement. <laughs> His greatest achievement, that he's a member of the diaspora who has gone abroad and has done very well. Michael, through Michael, we identify with the possibilities for growth. Have been recorded as in the Forbes list as a billionaire of all things. But it's not just a billionaire financially, but it's a billionaire in terms of his personality and his drive to see Jamaica grow. And so we're pleased to have Michael with us today. On the panel, we also have Dr. David Panton. I, uh, well, I, I almost said a very young Jamaican, but that's an image I, I, I have of David many years ago. He's, <laughs> David is the chairman and CEO of, a comp of an investment bank in Atlanta. He's also an adjunct professor, but and he's also an author. David is a brilliant Jamaican who has worked in business for many years. He created many entities within the Caribbean itself, and today is recognized as an outstanding individual. He's a member of a group called Tiger 21, Young President's Organization, and Leadership Atlanta Class 2012. He was named by Bioad Magazine as one of the eight Bioad pros on the 40 to watch, and by the Atlanta Business Chronicle as one of the, on, one of the 40 under 40 rising stars. He received his doctorate in management studies from Oxford University, where he was a Rhodes Scholar, and he has a, and his law degree from Harvard Business School. He also holds a master's in professional director certification from the American College of Corporate Directors. David was born and raised in Jamaica. He has been a senator in the upper house of Parliament. He is a proud father of two children. And after David, we have Ms. Shanique Smart. Shanique is currently a research officer at the Caribbean Policy Research Institute. And Shanique will take us through the research finding as to what is the contribution of the diaspora to Jamaica. And so this morning, ladies and gentlemen, we have a, I was about to say rich panel. And it is, in knowledge and experience, a panel who clearly will demonstrate to you what is required to achieve economic growth in Jamaica. And with that said, I, in I invite the Member of Parliament and the Minister with our portfolio in the Ministry of Economic Growth to present to us. Minister Vaz. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, members of the head table and panelists, and of course, to all the members of the diaspora who are here with us today, I welcome you home warmly. And for those visiting, I do, do the same and hope that you enjoy some of Jamaica and not just work. Your presence is a positive sign and augurs well for the future of our beloved country. I do hope that your sojourn back home is not limited to the conference only but you'll also be staying and rediscovering what a wonderful Jamaica we have. Ladies and gentlemen, the current Andrew Honus-led administration is systematically and clinically removing the obstacles that have hindered investment from getting underway for a number of years. Our vision to address this has led to the creation of what I consider to be far-reaching and visionary the Ministry of Economic Growth and Job Creation that I am proud to serve as Minister Without Portfolio. The configuration of this ministry, set up by the Prime Minister, the Most Honorable Andrew Honis, has most of the critical agencies which facilitate growth and investment under one ministry. These include agencies promoting investment such as JAMPRO, 
agencies financing investments such as Development Bank of Jamaica and the Exim Bank, and agencies facilitating investment and development, including, as I said, JAMPRO, National Environmental Planning Agency, and the National Land Agency. We are currently pursuing several projects, policies, and programs that, when realized, will increase employment levels in this country, increase confidence among our people, and fuel growth and jobs all over Jamaica. And I'm sure you'd have heard Mike Leachin speak about five in four, five percent growth by year four. Well, that's no longer year four. That's now five in three because it's been one year since. So we have a lot of work to do. We have also identified strategic investment priorities that will set the country on the path to growth with jobs. They include logistic hub initiatives, logistic hub initiatives, agro-parks, business processing outsourcing, tourism diversification to include ecotourism as well as health and wellness, and most important, medical tourism. The creative industries, energy diversification, and the international financial services. The national export strategy, which will be used to guide investment, has also outlined several priorities, including agro-processing, food and beverage, aquaculture, coffee, education, entertainment, ICT, fashion, and materials and mining. Ladies and gentlemen, we recognize that the private sector is our partner in delivering prosperity for our people. This government is a business-friendly government. It facilitates business with a view of them making profit that can be reinvested to the benefit of our country. In nearly two years, the Ministry has met with all major investors and has tried at best to remove obstacles to investments that were in the pipeline. In addition to facilitating new investments, our intention is to significantly reduce the time for the development approval process, which we believe still takes too long in some cases. During this period, we have brought, brought all the agencies together with investors at the inception of a project, indicate what is required upfront that would, would reduce the processing time for the various approvals that are needed to make investment happen. These include NEPA, NWC, NWA, and the security forces, along with JAMPRO. In addition, where government land is required to facilitate the investment, the several government agencies responsible for land meet with the investors to ensure that the land can be provided for the investment. These agencies include the Port Authority of Jamaica, the Urban Development Corporation, the Factories Corporation of Jamaica, and the National Land Agency. One such example is recently DNG, the cassava project where the government was able to identify the lands needed for the investment. All of the entities under the ministry have been charged to ensure that investment takes place to achieve economic growth targets. The financial agencies under the ministry have been given a special charge to facilitate SMEs given the critical role that they play in economic development. Special note, ladies and gentlemen, it should be made of the fact that the DBJ's innovation grant from, from New Ideas to Entrepreneurship Program, which benefits mostly micro, small, and medium enterprises with innovative products or business models that require financing to boost operations. The voucher for technical assistance program, which supports, again, loans to MS MSMEs with the potential to support several projects. The joint Exim DBJ loan facility for small manufacturers, a small and medium tourism and enterprise loan facility, and a credit enhancement facility, guarantee facility. Under JAMPRO's three-year business strategy, a plan is being developed to launch a national investment portal that will act as a comprehensive base of information and eventually transactions 
to facilitate investment. To date, Jampra has issued a request for interest for capable firms to develop a web-based portal that will provide an interface for prospective and existing investors in Jamaica. The portal will have three main functions. Information sharing, online application submission, and back office interface among government approval entities. Jampra has already started the process of developing an investor guide that would form the basis of the information to be shared on the portal, outlining all the steps involved in doing business in Jamaica. It is an anticipated that this project will complement the national investment policy and will help to better streamline business approvals and increase government's transparency and accountability. Our underground activities are enhanced by several policies which, well com completed, will significantly boost the investment climate. The International Migration and Development Policy specifically addresses members of the diaspora. The policy which is expected to be finalized this year is an initiative that the National Working Group on International Migration and Development with the participation of the Ministry of Economic Growth and Job Creation. Among other things, the policy seeks to ensure that international migration is adequately measured and monitored and influenced to serve the, de uh, the development need of Jamaica as outlined in the Vision 2030 Development Plan. We are also advancing the legislative framework to modernize Jamaica's business legislation infrastructure. The passing of various legislations will give effect to the establishment of the International Business and Financial Services Center, facilitating a wide range of sophisticated international business transactions. We have passed the Partnership General Act 2017 and the Partnership Limited Act 2017. The International Corporate and Trust Services Providers Act 2017, which will establish a regulatory regime governing the licensing and conduct of international corporate and trust service providers in the sector and the International Business Companies Act are to be tabled in Parliament shortly and we will govern the incorporation and operation of the international business companies. The objective, ladies and gentlemen, is to attract investment who will leverage the many attributes that Jamaica has to offer through which they will pursue nearshore services to support their global operations. Finally, the downtown Kingston redevelopment project, and that is based right where we are seated here today. I wish to tell you a little more about an exciting project that will be a real game changer in terms of the social and economic development of downtown Kingston and its numerous sta stakeholders. It's called the Downtown Kingston Redevelopment Project, and it is the first of its kind, certainly in the Caribbean. The approach to the project is novel, and we are moving beyond the traditional public-private partnership model in its execution to a much wider public-private community partnership model. This project is one way of rebuilding and modernizing an economy where high debt constraints are government to carry out needed infrastructure and other developments. Just to say very quickly that we have a number of projects, including the Carnation Market, which I'm sure everyone here has some knowledge of, and several other private sector initiatives, including hotels and, of course, entertainment parks and a cultural hub in Trenchtown. Ladies and gentlemen, it is an approach which should appeal to the diaspora, as from your vantage point, this project should fit easily into a new lens approach which you are more open to, given your exposure, which sometimes is not as easy for those from within the system. I want to close by making a call for the diaspora to participate. Ladies and gentlemen, we realize the importance of the members of the Jamaican diaspora and acknowledge the impact you have on the daily lives of us here in Jamaica. We recognize the important part remittances from your group have played in supporting families and friends. 
but we believe, believe that your group should have a greater role in investing in economic business opportunities, which could, could reduce the need for remittances by creating well-needed employment for your family and friends. There is st still far more that we can do as we all work together to fulfill our growth and job creation agenda, as well as our Vision 2030 mission of making Jamaica the place of choice to live, work, and raise families and do business. And as the minister with responsibility for investment, I want to close by saying that every government needs to have someone that the people can go to. It's one thing to speak about government. Who is government? How do I get to government? And the difference with my government is that I have volunteered that. I wasn't asked by the Prime Minister to do it. I volunteered because I know how important it is to interface with people, especially people who want to invest or people want to get information and direction as to how to go about doing business in Jamaica. So I'm going to do something very novel to show you the importance of each and every one of you seated here. I want you to take out your pen, and I want you to write down my number and my email address. The number is 876-381-4112. And my email address is Daryl, D-A-R-Y-L, dot vaz, V-A-Z or V-A-Z, depending on where you're from, at OPM, which is Office Prime Minister, dot G-O-V dot J-M, M as in Mike. And I want to encourage you to text me, WhatsApp me, call me, or email me to give me any information that you may require or any guidance you may require in relation to helping us grow this beautiful country and create the jobs that we so badly need. So let me close by saying welcome to you all and hopefully when you leave here you will be stimulated enough to say what can I do for Jamaica and how can I help grow this country as we say from poverty to prosperity. Thank you very much. I want to thank uh, Minister Vaz for that presentation. You have heard a lot that's happening in Jamaica. You have got his phone number. He's known to be the minister to get things done. So um, even from the health side yesterday, there are issues that came up. We can call that number and try and get things done. With that said, I'd like to present to you now the Chairman of the Economic Growth Council, the Honorable Dr. Michael Leachin. Yeah. Good morning, Mr. Chairman Earl. Good morning, good morning. Panel, welcome fellow diaspora community members. Minister, as Chairman Earl said, my greatest achievement was being born in Portland to Portland. I had nothing to do with that. <laughs> I was blessed. My greatest achievement was that I was born in the right era. I had nothing to do with that. I was blessed. I was born in, in an era which gave me the opportunity to own something, a pen, to be edu educated. I had nothing to do with that. I was blessed. As Chairman Earl said, my greatest achievement was I was born to a mother who set standards, who had values, who led by example. I had nothing to do with that. So I'm here. My being here is a function of many things that I had nothing to do with. I was blessed. But the biggest blessing I have had is that I was born in a country that made me a confident human being. So 
So, all of us in this room have the same background, the same attitude, the same aspirations, because we are bonded together by being Jamaicans, or second degree, if not first, second generation, if not first generation. Now, 10 years ago, I was being given an award uh, in Harlem by the Abyssinian Baptist Church. And the Reverend Calvin Butts said to the audience this particular evening, did you realize that over the last 40 years, 10 years ago, 50 years, now over 50 years, there was only one high school built in New York City. I was aghast. One high school built in, over the last 40 years in New York City. And it was not built by the federal government. It was not built by the state government. It was not built by the city government. It was built by the Abyssinian Development Corporation. So the Abyssinian Development Corporation was at the center of gentrification of Harlem. They catalyzed the gentrification of Harlem. And he continued by saying, and now that Harlem is being gentrified and the major community is moving into Harlem, and given the fact that the natives of Harlem were not traditional asset owners, the natives are being displaced. So when I heard that, I got nervous because I'm thinking, wow, the commonality between Harlem and Jamaica is absolute fantastic location. Harlem abuts Central Park, right? Jamaica is ideally located for anything. Commerce, fun, ideally located, time zone, etc. So when I heard that, I got, as I said, I got nervous because I thought, we are working hard to gentrify Jamaica. And we are going to gentrify Jamaica. We will be successful. And what I wouldn't want to see is that the natives of Jamaica, us in Jamaica, be displaced by foreigners, foreign investors coming in and realizing the opportunities here before we realize it and we will be displaced. No different. No different from the Harlemites. So if we don't learn from history, we're going to make the same mistakes of history. So I, I was blessed again to have graduated from Excelsior High School in 1969. And when I, gradu <laughs> when I graduated, I was blessed because we had growth in 1969. Guess how much the growth was in 1969? One guess in Jamaica, GDP growth. One guess. 5%? How much? 11.94%. Sorry, 5.41%. You're right. In 1969. So I was able to get a job in 1969 as a graduating student because there was growth in the economy. And in 1970, I was able to keep my job because guess how much the growth was in 1970? Let me see if you're really good. Eh? How much? How much? Down? 11.94%. You buck up. You buck up the first time. <laughs> right? 11.94% in 1970. So I was able to keep my job. And save enough money to have gone to Canada to do engineering. But had there not been growth, I would not have had that opportunity. And I would not be a fulfilled human being today. So, let us juxtapose that against the current situation. Over the last 20 years, we have had GDP growth of 0.5%. Not 5, not 11, 0.5. Over the last 10 years, it's even worse. We have had average GDP growth of 0.2%. So the converse of my experience is the experience of all the graduates today. Not good. So I was blessed. But it was, I didn't choose it. I got lucky. Right? So there's an imperative that we have to realize that growth is an imperative. 
Growth is essential for the development of human potential for the, for, for, to, to make sure that we have uh, a society that is, uh, is civil, a society that pres gives pres opportunities to every young person, that if they work hard, if they have high standards, they can succeed and live a fulfilled life. It is our responsibility collectively because all of us in this room were blessed. And if we were born in an era and we had the same experience that, that I had. But today, this generation does not have it. So we all are bond bonded together by that and that obligation. So over the what, what this means is we have an entire generation that knows nothing about growth because we have had 0.5% for the last 20 years, 0.2 in the last 10 years. So all they know is stagnation. We have an entire generation that only knows stagnation, which means that we have young graduates with no opportunities to get a job and live an independent life, which means that having no growth means that there's no incentive to go to school. There's no expectations. There's, a, there's an expectation of hopelessness. The conditions that created low growth also caused the following realities. A devaluation of all assets. A devaluation of all assets. A spiral, a poverty spiral. Low confidence, emigration, corruption, poorly educated graduates. A decimation of our middle class. A devaluation of societal values. Devaluation of currency and general apathy. That's what no growth has created. Conversely, growth will reverse all of those current conditions. So ladies and gentlemen, it is our collective responsibility to make sure we do everything possible. And we not only do, but we promote growth in Jamaica. Everything possible to reverse all of those conditions. In other words, let me repeat, no gr high growth will cause a revaluation of all assets. High growth will cause, cause a revaluation of high, uh, all assets. High growth will minimize crime, will avert the poverty spiral, will build confidence, will stop emigration. And we, we, we need some emigration, but we also need to keep our best and brightest here at home. High growth will prevent... <laughs> high growth will minimize corruption. We'll have highly educated uh, graduates. We'll have a, a, a fulfilled rebuild of our middle class. High growth will have a, a, a revaluation, a reset of societal values. High growth will make sure our currency is stable and high growth in, uh, will cause, will, will, will have a confident society. So it is, thank you. So on April 27, 2016, the Prime Minister made the announcement that we should, there's going to be an economic growth council, and he appointed me the chairman of the EGC. And that was a momentous day in my life. Because not very often a human being is given the opportunity to impact on a country in such a meaningful way. So it was a humbling, meaningful, pivotal day in my life on April the 27th, 2016. So on that day, in my commencement address, I said, notwithstanding 0.2% in the last 10 years, in the next four years to 2016, April 2016, we will achieve 5% GDP growth. We have to achieve 5% GDP growth. That was April the 27th. April the 28th, the next morning I woke up and I thought, what did I say? 5%? <laughs> 5% 5 is 25 times 0 0.2. How is that possible? But if you don't aim high, if you don't aspire, you'll never achieve. So the only question now is how? The how. So here is the methodology. Well, over the next year, we have sat and uh, interacted, and an interaction would be like an hour, two and a half hours, with one over 150 stakeholders of Jamaica. So we listened to the stakeholders, we devised a plan. Our third responsibility is to monitor and report 
on the progress of that plan in a very transparent way. So every quarter, the EGC, and it will happen again this Thursday, it's our quarterly report to the nation. We report to the nation as to what our uh, initiatives are, where we are in that four-year journey, what mileposts we have exceeded, what mileposts we have not exceeded, and who is responsible for exceeding, and who is responsible for not exceeding. So it's total transparency. If our reputation is on the line, the 10 council members, to create growth, we need the cooperation of everybody. So in addition to monitoring report, we have to sell and motivate. So that's the methodology. Now, why were we so confident that 10 Jamaicans who had one goal in mind, nation building, why were we so confident that this is going to be achieved? Well, the table is set for growth, actually. Why? Because all of us are mad as hell that we could have done this to ourselves. Go from 11.4 to 0 0.2 in Crazy. When we have so many resources, so we are mad as hell that we could have impaled ourselves. And you, you, you really change when you realize, when you hit that nadir, you mad as hell at yourself for not fulfilling your potential. So we're all mad as hell at ourselves. First precondition for growth. We are mad as, we, we are, the fiscal house is also in place for growth. Inflation, the table is set because inflation today is at a historical low. Less than 3, 4%, 3%, 4%, less. Our NIR is improving. Our currency has stabilized. Energy prices down. The table is set because telecom prices also down by 90%. Confidence returning. Today we're experiencing the highest confidence since, uh, since independence. And we have the support of the multinationals, the multilaterals. And the government has accepted its role as being singular, which is to enable and facilitate growth. So it's very clear. So the table is set. So what has, as I said, the EGC over the last year, we've had over 150 meetings with stakeholders. What did we hear? We, here's what we heard. We heard that the reason why things are as they have been, 0.2% in the last 10 years, because of 15 primary growth retardants. You have to know what stop the growth to, to, to know what you have to deal with. We heard from our stakeholders that there's a lack of focus on a goal, no plan, no accountability. We heard that there's political tribalism. We heard that there's a lack of leadership with a focus on growth. We heard that there's distraction by fiscal mismanagement. We heard that crime is a big retardant to growth. We heard it's difficult to do business in Jamaica. We heard there's poor capital allocation of our financial resources or assets. We heard there's high cost of capital uh, in Jamaica. We heard it's, uh, sorry, we need better access to capital. We heard high cost of energy. We heard high cost, uh, low, unproductive labor force, no confidence by investors, corruption, sabotage, and a low standard of expectation of self and country. That's what we heard. And by the way, those 15 gross retardants really were our call to action, what we had to do to remove those gross retardants, because to increase speed, one has to minimize friction, and those are the 15 primary friction, frictions. We have to re re minimize frictions and increase horsepower. That's what you do to increase speed, right? Minimize friction and increase horsepower. So having had those meetings, we came up with eight growth policy initiatives and 111 sub-initiatives. And these initiatives are being enacted now by the government. And our role now is to monitor and make sure that they are implemented. Because we know that ideas, sorry, success <laughs> is 1% strategy. The 120, all this body of work that went into coming up with the, the initiatives is 1%. Success is 1% strategy, 99% execution. So now 
It's, we're in the execution phase. So fellow diaspora community members, I'm standing here to you and say, look, I can give you my personal testimony. I created my wealth in Canada. I came back to Jamaica because I saw an opportunity. <clears throat> and the opportunity was born out of the following. And there are three preconditions that have to be met before you really can have a successful investment. Number one, there has to be a difference between perception and reality. And today, definitely there's a difference between perception and reality. The reality of Jamaica is that we're dealing with issues with, with frontal, a frontal attack and 100% energy. That's not the perception outside of here. So there has to be a difference between perception and reality for you to create wealth. Secondly, there must be inefficiencies for you to create outside wealth. Today, lots of inefficiencies. So the conditions are great to create a lot of wealth in Jamaica. And thirdly, there must be a lack of equity capital flowing into the business, the region, the sector, or the country. And today, there is a lack of equity capital. So the conditions are set for to create outsized wealth. The will is there, and it's happening. So ladies and gentlemen, I would suggest to you that if you do not get on the train now, it's going to leave you. And those of us who see it are confident will reap the rewards. So you can invest in your own country, do well, do good, and have lots of fun. Thank you. I want to thank Dr. Lee Chin for that presentation. Tremendous amount of work done by the EGC. A lot has already been achieved, both by the council as well as their work stimulating other people to do things. And so I want to thank him for volunteering, because that's what it is, volunteering his time and his resources to help to shape a growth agenda for Jamaica. We spoke about the restless Jamaicans. It's that absence of growth that is in part responsible for diaspora movement. And now we need to address it. And there's a man who has been tasked with the responsibility from that Economic Growth Council to deal with that issue. And that's Dr. David Panton, who is chairman of the task force within the Diaspora Growth Council to address uh, the impact and the involvement of the diaspora in achieving the growth targets. David. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. After that uh, stirring rendition by Mr. Lee Chin, by Mike, I'd like to book my ticket on the train, Mike. <laughs> I'm there. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, let me... Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for allowing me to speak. Uh, the Honorable Darrell Vaz, Minister Without Portfolio. The Honorable Senator, the Honorable Minister Kamina Johnson-Smith, Minister of Foreign Affairs and Foreign Trade. Ambassador Marcia Gilbert Roberts, Permanent Secretary in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Foreign Trade. Our Honorary Consuls, who I see here, Ms. Trude Deans, who is our youngest Honorary Consul to New York. Not so. Um, what am I, Consul General? What am I? I'm, I'm so focused on honorary consuls. <laughs> Consul General to New York. Your clock is ticking. Oh, my clock is ticking. <laughs> and Franz Hall, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. Um, many years ago, in, uh, in 1952, uh, the state of Israel was quite poor. They had basically just been founded. And the then leadership wanted to raise some money from the Jewish diaspora. And they went to the United States and thought they could raise probably $250,000. They had a meeting in Times Square, and they ended up raising about $25 million. The then prime minister set up an entity called Israel Bonds, which is based in New York, which last year raised over a billion dollars in bonds for the state of Israel, and since its inception has raised over $45 billion from the Jewish diaspora. Now, you might say to yourself, well, that's the Jewish diaspora. They're very rich. They have a lot of money. The reality is that last year, that $1.2 billion that they raised came from about 50,000 members of the Jewish diaspora who contributed or invested an average of about 11,000 U.S. dollars. They did this because of their commitment to the state of Israel. 
and it has made a tremendous impact on the state of Israel. And I've long felt that that approach of setting up an entity like that, that Israel Bond for Jamaica, Jamaican Bond Agency as it were, could make a significant impact on our country. Jamaicans send back 2.2 billion US dollars a year in remittances, so Jamaicans aren't poor. They're sending a lot of money back to Jamaica. They clearly have the capital, but the question is how do we incentivize the members of the Jamaican diaspora to most effectively participate and engage in Jamaica. So I've been asked by Mike Leachin, and I was very reluctant, I'm based in Atlanta, Georgia, I run a business, actually several businesses, and felt that I really didn't have the time to do this, but as you can tell, Mike is very persuasive. Uh, and then of course he used a, a little trick, he got my son's godfather, Ambassador Dr. Nigel Clark, to rope me in as well. So when Nigel called, I had sort of had to agree and so I agreed to assist the Economic Growth Council, which I think is doing an exceptionally good job. And Ms. Maureen Dent is in the audience, so Maureen, good job. And, and all the members of the council, please give them a hand. And Mr. Leachin. So I decided to help out. Uh, Mike mentioned that there were eight recommendations, and one of the recommendations was harnessing the power of the diaspora. And I met with several members who were active in the diaspora community, including Mr. Wayne Golding, who is here, including Professor Neville Ying, who runs the Jamaica Diaspora Institute, spoke to Mr. Earl Jarrett, who's the chairman of the Jamaica Diaspora Foundation, and spoke to many other members in the diaspora and many other leaders of organizations. And as a result of that, we came up in this report, and I encourage you all to read it. If you haven't read it, you can get it online at 5in4.com, F-I-V-E. I-N-F-O-U-R dot com. I'm not as brave as Daryl to give out my telephone number, but I'll give you the website. <laughs> I'll actually, I'll give out my number, but I fear that no one will call me. So <laughs> if you're interested, you can ask. Um, so at 5 and com is the actual call to action of the EGC. Eight recommendations, and within the eight recommendations, one is harnessing the power of the diaspora. And there were five main sub-recommendations, as it were, to focus on. And they were all related to problems. Problem number one, which I, if anyone read the Observer today, it's a sort of a sad headline. It says, diaspora fed up, which is sort of true. <laughs> and I can sort of understand. And it was an article related to the fact that there has been an ambulance at the customs, which has not been cleared in 10 months, which is needed for a hospital. So on one hand, you have you know, half the, uh, half the ambulances in Jamaica are not working, and members of the diaspora in the UK got money and sent uh, an ambulance. It just needs to pay customs and hasn't been able to come through. Now, I think that will be addressed, and I think it will be done. But that one example is an example of the type of frustration that many members of the diaspora feel. They're very sort of fed up with the bureaucracy in Jamaica. And so one of the five sub-recommendations was the, effectively the establishment of a fast-track, one-stop agency with a 24-hour hotline in order to allow members of the diaspora and others, by the way, who are interested in Jamaica to basically facilitate and expedite their activities. This is really something which is um, uh, very consistent with and parallel to what the ministry that uh, Minister Vaz leads is doing, and it's related to the Porto, which is th that he mentioned, which is being done by JAMPRO. So this task force, which was set up by the EGC, the Diaspora Task Force, which I've had the pleasure to lead over the past six months, uh, has been working very closely with JAMPRO on the implementation of the investment portal, and also to do what all of you here have been blessed to receive, which is this government at your service. Is there anyone here who has seen the government at your service or participated in it? Nobody? Okay, there we have members. So that is a, a mechanism where all of these agencies are in one place. And so you're fortunate if you wanted to use any of these agencies or get something done with your passport or with a title or you know, registering a company, you can do it right here. But there's no reason that that same setup shouldn't be available on a permanent basis. So one of the activities we're focusing on is basically institutionalizing effectively government of your at your service on an ongoing basis for members of the diaspora. So it's not just for a chosen few, but for all the diaspora community. The second problem that was identified was a lack of connectivity between members of the diaspora and Jamaica. 
particularly second generation and third generation. There are no citizens of the United States, of the United Kingdom, of Canada, of various other countries. Many of them somewhat felt Jamaican, but didn't have that connectivity. Other countries like India have addressed that situation in part by providing a, a card, an immigration card of, in India, of people of Indian ancestry. So as long as you could prove that you were of Indian ancestry, you would uh, get this card. So one of the recommendations that we're focused on is the establishment of what we call a global Jamaica immigration card for members of the diaspora who have foreign passports, but who when they come to Jamaica, I don't know if this has happened to anyone, you have to go through the visitor line. And if you go through the Jamaica line, they say, well, you're not Jamaican. You have a Jamaica US passport, or a UK passport, or a Canada passport. And you're like, I am Jamaican. So we, uh, we feel that a global Jamaican immigration card will allow you to go through the Jamaican line and will also provide other benefits. One of the things that we have done is we have worked with the Ministry of National Security, as well as the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Foreign Trade, uh, to establish a, uh, identify a firm to help us do a feasibility study on the global Jamaican immigration card. And that firm that we have selected through a t competitive tender process is the Sir Arthur Lewis Institute for Economic and Social Study, e for Social and Economic Studies. And they're represented here today. Where is Professor Kinley? Is he here? Are they here? Okay, very good. Please stand up. Uh, we are planning to do a survey, which I wanted to do during while I was speaking so that you could fill it out, but I was told by the guest staff, I mean by <laughs> Professor Ying, <laughs> that there will be no survey done during the session. But at the break, we can do a survey. So I'm going to ask the individual, please stand up one more time so you see them. Ask them to stand at the doors, so at the session, where we can hand out uh, the surveys and ask you to return it to them, please. So thank you very much for doing that. No thanks to you, Professor Ying. No, just kidding. <laughs> Professor Ying is doing an excellent job. The third recommendation uh, was involved participation, increased fin uh, financial participation, like the Israel bonds that I mentioned. So we have been working closely with the Ministry of Finance and the legal representatives of the government of Jamaica. Uh, one of the challenges is to do a retail bond in the United States and in the United Kingdom and in Canada. And we have started that process. We feel fairly confident that we will be able to have a bond that we can launch, if not later this year, certainly in early next year. And we encourage you all to participate. One of the questions in the survey uh, that you will see, and hopefully you'll participate in uh, one or two questions are about the bond, and we'd love to get your feedback on the bond. The fourth recommendation was related to more leadership and civic participation by members of the diaspora. As you probably know, Jamaica has honorary consuls in addition to our consul generals. Uh, we have approximately 80 honorary consuls around the world, but other countries have many, many more, particularly countries that have uh, tourist, uh, where their economies are based on tourism. So France has 300 plus, Spain has almost 400, and smaller countries like Mauritius has uh, close to 250 honorary consuls. An honorary consul is a great position that many members of the diaspora, I think, might be interested in serving in, where it allows you to not only represent Jamaicans in certain areas uh, on the uh, uh, related to consular activities, but also to be an ambassador for Jamaica and to encourage people to learn more about Jamaica, to come back home, to visit, etc. So the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Foreign Trade is currently undergoing a, a review of the existing honorary consul policies, and, uh, and once that is done, then obviously there will be an effort to outreach to encourage more members to think about becoming honorary consuls. And then the final area related to utilization of members of the diaspora in a way that uh, will benefit Jamaica. As you probably know, Jamaicans do extremely well when they go abroad. We actually have some very, very talented and successful Jamaicans. And uh, having gotten involved in this process, I've been amazed at the types of Jamaicans that I've met and what they've done. It may come as a surprise to you. You know, Mike Leachin said, you know, if we want to get medical tourism in Jamaica, we need to go to the Mayo Clinic and bring them to Jamaica. 
So after he said that, I was so moved. I'm very moved when Mike speaks. <laughs> I called up the Mayor Clinic, said, you guys should come. And they I quickly found out that the head of their trustee board is a Jamaican. <laughs> Uh, Dr. Franklin Prendergast, who is a leading, you know, well-renowned international uh, cancer surgeon. Um, and so we are speaking to him and trying to find ways in which, and he is very interested. He says, I'm actually glad you called because I've been trying to do something in Jamaica, but, you know, it's not something. No one had called me. He says, I'm, I'm, I'm not really appreciated. And so we need to extend that hand of appreciation. Some of you may have heard of a firm called Home Depot Stores. The president of Home Depot Stores is a Jamaican woman. Some of you may have heard of a shoe company called Nike. The new president of Nike Brands is a Jamaican. And I could go on. So we have very talented, very successful, very connected Jamaicans in the diaspora who have relationships and resources or access to resources which could be tremendously helpful to Jamaica. And so one of the signature uh, initiatives which is still on the contemplation and structure is the establishment of an entity called Global Connect Jamaica, which is really a repurposing of the Diaspora Foundation to bring in on an advisory board these very talented and successful Jamaicans in various different parts of the world and bringing them to, uh, to bring their, ta their talents, their knowledge, their relationships, and their resources to bear to help uplift Jamaica. So I'm on fully on board. Uh, Mike, I've got my uh, train ticket. I've kept within my time, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> I'd like to thank you all. And if anyone has any questions, please feel free uh, to ask me. And I'll do what uh, the minister did. I'll give you my number. My number is 1-404-713-1700. Uh, and my email is david at pantonequity.com. If you have any feedback, thoughts, advice, I will be glad to listen. Oh, I'll repeat. The number is 404-713-3400. And my email is david, D-A-V-I-D, at pantonequity, P-A-N-T-O-N-E-Q-U-I-T-Y, dot com. And if I can't uh, address any of the issues, I will make sure that the Ministry of Foreign Affairs is well abreast <laughs> of them. <laughs> Thank you all very much. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, just a quick announcement. I heard just shortly a while ago and read about the ambulance. And I can indicate that I have spoken to the Minister of Finance by WhatsApp and that a moratorium of the duty will be granted so it can be cleared. And, uh, and it will be dealt with internally between the Ministry of Health and the Ministry of Finance in terms of their budget. But just a word of caution, because I get these emails and issues almost daily. It's very important that before you do anything in terms of charitable um, gestures, that you contact the particular ministry before, because we have very stringent arrangements with the IMF and others, so it's not as easy to just say, oh, grant a waiver or do it. We have to do a lot of internal. And also, the bottom line is that it's easier if you get directions from them as to how to go about it uh, because you have to be actually registered as a charitable organization and sometimes you are not. That causes, but we welcome all of the assistance because we need it, but we want to do it in a structured way. So don't be overzealous and not only get and acquire and ship, get everything together and then contact either the particular ministry or I give you my email address and I will guide you as to what to do and we can do as much paperwork before rather than get into situations. And this happens every day, by the way. This ambulance is just a big ticket item. Wheelchairs, medication, uh, beds, you name it, school books, you name it. So just a word of caution, but to say that in diaspora week, at least we accomplished one thing. We're going to get the ambulance cleared. <laughs> They used to say, in the old days, you know, let Daryl do it. <laughs> <laughs> and I think we have had that experience here today. I want to thank David for that presentation on the, on the diaspora and the plan from the EGC in terms of uh, working with the diaspora. 
for the diaspora to, in partnership, grow with Jamaica. Because part of what you heard him say as well, too, was the issue of how does Jamaica also impact you in your home country so that you can have that confidence that Michael Leakin so eloquently spoke about that's necessary if you're going to be successful. So we have heard about the plans. We have heard uh, about what's the goal for the Jamaican economy. We have heard of the anemic growth that we have had over many, many years. And it's, uh, it's oftentimes said that what gets counted and measured gets action. And to a great extent, the diaspora has never really been counted. And all we have counted is the private transfers called remittances, which accounts for some $2 billion. But behind that is a raft of investments that come in the form of savings and real estate and many other things. And now we're going to hear from Capri. And we have Ms. Shanique Smart, who is a research officer at Capri, ably backed up by Dr. Damian King, who is sitting in the audience, uh, who have done a piece of research in this area and will share with us some of the findings. I now present to you uh, Ms. Shanique Smart. So good morning, everyone, and good morning to my panelists. This, this morning, when I want to think about, um, when we think about countries like India, like El Salvador, like Mexico, like Ireland, that has been raising millions and billions of Jamaican dollars annually through partnerships with their diasporas, it is becoming more and more evident to individuals like myself and you in the audience, as well as the government, that the diaspora is just like a citizen. They're only located somewhere else. And so when I take myself, for example, I grew up in, in, in Spalding, um, Manchester. I migrated to Kingston. And I got an indication I'm now employed at Capri. And monthly, I send remittances to my mom and dad back in the country. And beyond sending remittances, I also like to visit. I like to be a part of what's happening. But prior to the building of Highway 2000, that was constrained somewhat. I mean, it would take me approximately three hours, sometimes four, to get there. And now, with the highway, and now with the highway, and now with the highway, it takes me approximately a third of that time. The idea here is that economic growth is about bridging separate economic spaces, right? <coughs> Engaging the diaspora is to bridge that geographical boundary between the Jamaicans at home and the Jamaicans abroad for the ones who wanna be just involved in their home country as I wanna be involved in, the, in my hometown as well. And <clears throat> so we recognize that engagement of the diaspora is to build that bridge, not a physical bridge like the Highway 2000, but to ensure that their interaction locally is facilitated, it's easy. There's not a lot of constraints and considerations when you're thinking about making it at home. And when we, we, we think about the diaspora, their size magnifies their significance and importance. The Jamaica Diaspora Institute had estimated that there is approximately three million Jamaican diaspora outside these borders. So with as many individuals of Jamaican descent living outside the borders as within it, clearly we're starting to recognize that the significance goes beyond any individual. We see there was an estimated 1.7 million in the US, 800,000 in UK, another 300,000 in Canada, and 200,000 elsewhere. So it's almost too obvious why a forum such as this one 
and the research that the Caribbean Policy Research Institute and Jamaica Diaspora Institute is currently undergoing is so important. Because while a lot of us recognize that there's value in the diaspora, there has not been a lot of empirical evidence and data towards validating this value proposition. And <coughs> that lends us to two of three objectives of the research that we're currently doing, of which we'll be sharing some of the preliminary findings with you today. And the first objective for us was to determine how significant is the diaspora's contribution in Jamaica? In what are they contributing beyond remittances? And secondly, um, as the panelists have been alluding to all morning, there's the idea that there is value, some untapped value, value which we're not getting because the government or there is no entity deliberately exploiting whatever this potential is. We want to find out is that true? Is there in fact an untapped economic value that with the right strategies we can partner with the diaspora to exploit? Now, to realize these objectives, we identified five areas um, to begin with for assessment. The first being remittances, the second investments, the third uh, exports, um, tourism as well as philanthropy. And we began by actually documenting the diaspora's demographic profile and we recognized that contrary to what a lot of persons thought, the diaspora is in fact a very professional bunch, being in very professional jobs, very educated, and earning much higher incomes than they used to. We now begin by taking a look at the first era of remittances where we try to assess what the current value is. Now, this area is the single most popular indicator of the diaspora's contribution and connection to Jamaica. Most persons know this value. And it records an average of $2.2 billion annually. But we took it a step further. A lot of times when we think about the diaspora's contribution, we only think about the recipients. But the business environment benefits as well. There's value there too. These companies, there are companies who thrive just on remittances alone. And we estimated what was the revenue that these businesses were earning from these transmissions annually of $2.2 billion. And to date, we have estimated that at $188 million US dollars. Now, while this figure isn't entirely attributable to the Jamaican environment, it does give an idea of the benefit of the diaspora beyond the individuals who receive it, but to the business environment as well. We then sought to estimate what the potential of the diaspora was, what's the potential value in the era of remittances. And <coughs> we, we estimated taking a look and using some statistical methods and so forth, and taking a look at 22 countries across the region and in the world, uh, we estimated it at 2.1 billion, interesting, because what this demonstrated to us is that we're, what we're currently receiving is exceeding what we're expected to get, given the similarities with the other countries and the differences. Um, <coughs> now, to get an idea of how significant these values are and how significant the value to Jamaica is, we stacked it up against our GDP in 2016, and we recognize here that remittances currently contributes approximately 16% of our GDP, and that is in fact a significant figure. We're talking about 14 billion US dollars here. Now, we went to investment to estimate what the diaspora's investment was. We tried to estimate what, <coughs> um, we take a look at their investment in the banks, their investment in businesses, and their investments in the stock market, and to date, um, we have estimated a total of four, over 400 million US dollars invested in the Jamaican economy. And I mean, we're not done as yet. So this is showing an indication that the diaspora is in fact involved in investment in Jamaica. Now to realize what the potential was, 
we, take, we took into consideration three elements. We took into consideration three elements. We had a look at the size of the diaspora, the earnings of the diaspora, and their propensity to save. That would give us an idea of the savings the diaspora is earning. And annually, we estimated that the Jamaican diaspora of the 500 billion which the World Bank speaks to is saving approximately 12.8 billion US dollars. And while we're not expecting to get all of this money, a portion of this can be targeted for local investments. And for the purposes of this presentation, we say, let's say we can get a minimum of, say, 10% of this amount. Yes? And of course, we could get more. We're looking at approximately $2 billion, which accounts for a potential value of 14% of our GDP. And then we took a look at exports. Now, the presence of the diaspora population definitely has been shown in the literature to lead to higher trade flows between the country of origin and the country of destination because it's fairly difficult, we can agree, to establish and introduce unfamiliar goods in a foreign territory, especially our non-traditional goods. What we considered here to estimate the exports that the diaspora not only purchase, but facilitates its purchase. We took a look at the places where the diaspora was mostly concentrated, and we went through the export files of every single line item that was exported for five years, I think, um, approximately. And what we recognize is that in the US, the UK, and Canada, the diaspora approximately attributes, um, taking account in the US is 22%. Um, in the US, it is 10%, and in Canada, another 7%. And that gave us a total of 89 million US dollars that we can clearly say the diaspora is the one facilitating these exports and processes. And that's approximately 10% of all the exports that are sent to this region. And we also took a look at what the potential could be. And <coughs> we have estimated 126 million, which is 14%, but again, these, these data are preliminary and we are refining our estimates. This is a, a generally a unique area because as I said earlier, while we're representing what the diaspora purchase, they also facilitate even the idea of a business being set up in the location in the first place. Yes, and recommending these goods to their um, neighbors and friends and introducing it locally. So these figures might be seeming relatively smaller than the others, but I believe this presents a very unique area for us to exploit for a partnership. We start that up against GDP, and it's um, adding a potential value of 0.9%. And I want to remind us here, we're talking about US billion dollars, OK? Um, then we took a look at philanthropy, and we were able to estimate what the contributions to healthcare in terms of donations were to date. And we found that to be 14 million US dollars to healthcare alone since 2014. That's on average, I'm talking donation, not skills, not expertise, which we almost cannot put a figure on, but 14 million dollars in donations by the diaspora. That's approximately 4 million US dollars per year. Um, this area is one which we're also looking to refine our estimates on education contribution, where there is also significance. Again, showing the value of the Jamaican diaspora to the economy, we're stacking up what they're currently doing and the potential against our GDP. And the other area which we assessed was tourism, right? Now, <coughs> The diaspora population can help to open markets for new tourist donations. And currently, the estimated expenditure of the diaspora through a survey which um, Capri disseminated just approximately two months now, um, estimated that the diaspora is spending a minimum of 151 million US dollars annually. Now, that is, the, the diaspora generally represents 7% of all the stopover visits, and we do expect these figures to increase. And this, um, 
the dollar figure just represented is 6% of the total expenditure by all tourists that come in annually. And I want to say here that the potential value for tourism, we have not yet done that. Um, we're in the process of doing that. But it's clear that the diaspora represents value in this area because their value is not just simply having more diaspora, spending more money, right? But the fact that they occupy a niche that um, can attract other non-diaspora individuals. There is a potential for the diaspora to act as brand ambassadors, yes, and promoters of the Jamaican brand, and that is something, again, that's invaluable. So there's definitely an area of potential here. While we don't have a number just as yet, we will in the near future. We start that up against GDP again, and so to put things into perspective, we recognize that currently, it's not 17 or 16% that we speak about with remittances that the diaspora is contributing. But in fact, the diaspora contributes a minimum of 23% to the Jamaican economy, and our estimates have shown a potential at a minimum again of 35%. And that leaves us with an unexploited value of 12% of GDP. I must say here that yesterday I heard the, the, the Minister um, of Education say he needed 13.5 billion Jamaican dollars to build 17 schools. Now that is approximately 108 million US dollars. Now that's just 6% of this gap that's here. That amount the minister taunted yesterday like a big figure is just 6% of the potential that we have identified. So that gives an idea of how significant what is currently contributed and what the potential that exists. Now, <coughs> having demonstrated clearly to date that there is value beyond remittances and that there is a lot of value to be exploited in terms of the potential partnerships between the diaspora. We now will be undergoing the process to determine what are the hindrances to these opportunities. What can facilitate a better partnership for a mutually beneficial relationship between Jamaica and the diaspora? And I want to note that we collected a lot of this information through a survey disseminated and I want to thank all the persons who have filled it out already, but the process is ongoing. It requires cooperation, not just a project-by-project -project basis, but continuous data collection to make this possible. A lot of the data was collected through primary research, research that was not done before. And so there needs to be, we need to start that data collection process to ensure these figures can be refined some more. Yes, and to ensure that going forward, the value is clear. And here we present our survey, which is online, as I indicated, continuous, and we're still accepting responses. So we're just asking everyone and uh, thanking all the persons and businesses who have facilitated us to date so that we could be able today to not only speak that there is value, but demonstrate using the numbers that there is uh, some value. We want to thank the Jamaica National, especially for supporting us in this initiative. They have been uh, the partner in ensuring that we could even get this diaspora survey out. So beyond financial support, sharing our surveys to their networks um, was instrumental in ensuring that in such a short space of time, we could get the results for the conference today. Thank you very much. And I look forward to speaking with anyone for filling out our surveys and collecting information as we go along. Thank you. Thank you. That, that, thank you so much, uh, Shanique, for the presentation on the, on, the, on the work of Capri, and want to thank Dr. Damon King, who is here as well, too. As I said, what gets counted gets action. And what we're seeing here, preliminary, a 35% contribution to the GDP, potentially, and 24% currently, would suggest that the diaspora represents a bigly part of the Jamaican economy. 
and where you have such a contribution, I can't see why we, sh we, we shouldn't have a dedicated agency of the state that is committed to developing policy, to developing an approach to deal with this wide community. It seems that it's possibly larger than tourism in itself and, so <laughs> and possibly larger than many other contributions from other areas of the society. And so as a group, you need to you leverage the data once it's completed to drive policy, to drive resource allocation to the things that are of importance to you. Now, we move into question and answer time. And we're going to move fairly swiftly. We have two mics in the room here. The panel is, we have, we're rich with information today. We're also rich with energy and direction. So I wanted to, to pose some questions to put the issues that are on your minds to the panel. And so we start. And you want to identify yourself and then we go forward. Yes, good morning. My name is Victoria Rauer from Los Angeles. I'd like to say good morning to Chairman Jarrett, the Honorable Daryl Vaz, Chairman Michael Lee Chin, Very Chairman quickly. David Panton, and also Ms. Smart. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, all the honorable and ministerial members and Thank special you. guests. Thank you. Now, I say this, uh, many know me from the young and the restless in diagnosis murder and making millions upon millions of dollars for CBS, Sony, and Viacom and selling a lot of soap, hence the soap opera industry for Procter & Gamble, which started in 1934. Under the auspices of black business in the United States, I was able to raise the capital to film a soap opera series here, starring, guest starring Oliver Samuels, and hiring at least two dozen Jamaican professionals led by Limner, Bard and Limited, we get and I'm getting to the point, right, sir, but this is very important because yes. it has to do with economics yes. and interfacing with job creation. Yes, yes. We will be on broadcast here in Jamaica mm -hmm. uh, in August yes. after the World Championships, and Robert Johnson, who founded BET in the States, has given me a licensing deal where it will air, stream on UMC TV this Friday. But the point is, sir, that my investors won't continue to invest with shooting in Jamaica unless I can prove financial interfacing with Jamaican investment in the public or private sector. Can you tell me, after over 100 meetings since 2015 here in Jamaica, at my own expense, how I can expedite this process as we go into shooting the second season, August 21st, because my goal, and those many in this room know my commitment to Jamaica, having been raised by a Jamaican foster mother and Jamaican roots, how can I possibly manifest this as once again uh, an American investor has come forward for the second season? But I must prove Jamaican investment. Thank you very much. I'm gonna take about three or four questions and then we, we respond, we have the panel respond. Thank you. To the right. Honorable Minister. Name. And all protocols observed. My name is Carlina Agard, and I'm a member of Jamaicans Inspired UK. I'm a risk and value professional who's worked on $0.4 billion programs that are, uh, are significant investments for organisations to build up their infrastructure. I have a couple of questions for the panel. What one first. <laughs> so the first is, what scope is the infrastructure investment? going to have in terms of your priorities for developing Jamaica? And also, how would I go about getting involved specifically? The priorities for investments and how you can get involved. Thank you so much. Thank to you. the left. OK, I'll be, I'll be very short. My name is Dr. Beverly Smith. I was a former trade and investment sector chair for the Northeast US. Um, so I was very pleased with the way in which um, the approach of the ECG was framed in terms of simultaneously addressing both the resistance to growth as well as uh, addressing the driving force. Now, it would be overly simplistic to think that these threats to growth are static or that everything is in your control. So my question is, what kind of mechanism do you have in place to ensure that we not only achieve growth but that the growth is sustainable? Um, what we have variables such as change in government 
and the very dynamic uh, subculture. What are the mechanisms do you have in place to ensure that this growth will be sustained over time? Thank you very much. And to the right. Oh, my mic stopped working. No. Oh, there we go. Um, good morning. My name is Marie Kellier. I uh, live in Los Angeles. And um, my question, one simple question. Um, I need to get the website for the survey from Shanique. And uh, okay. also for um, Mr. Leachin, I wanted to find out a little bit more uh, specifics in terms of how, um, how specifically can we in the diaspora get more involved in the work that you're doing with the Economic Growth Council. Thank you. Okay, and to the left. Hello, my name is Coral Crew Noble, and I live in Jamaica, Good. and I'm from the diaspora. Um, it's been a very great presentation, and for Mr. Michael Lee Chin, he said what's missing is the how. I love the five in four. Um, and then David said um, about the lack of gratitude. So my question is, how does the Economic Growth Council, or do they even, plan on dealing with the cultural aspect, and when I say cultural aspect, I mean today's social norms that are expressed from people living in Jamaica towards the people of the diaspora and from the diaspora. You want to be more specific? What are these norms that you are experiencing? <laughs> the and we, we can be frank. Okay, can we be frank? Well, yes. for instance, I am from the diaspora. I contribute significantly prior to living here financially, living here by giving my time and my expertise. And there is a lack of gratitude. In fact, the... Um, <laughs> can we really be frank? Be very frank. <laughs> yeah. In fact, um, yesterday there was a demonstration um, in one of the presentations of the culture that's here in and I apologize, I don't mean to offend anyone, but um, of our leadership in that here in Jamaica, our leadership is we are the be all end all, and there's oftentimes a residue left of a level of disrespect to other people if you have not accomplished that level here in Jamaica. I'm not saying it's not anywhere else, right? Because in America, yes. where I lived for two decades, yes. we have someone who's in the press every day who yes. demonstrates that. But inside of who we are as Jamaicans and that, across the globe we are recognized as leaders even though we're small and our leadership just oozes out. I deliver programs, um, contributory, in the prisons and I d deliver leadership and transformative thinking programs and these inmates shift their lives. It reduces recidivism. There's this transformative learning um, technologies, many of them out in the world that we could apply here in Jamaica. And in being here, I've done some examples with regular people off the street who've transformed their lives. But so if we're going mm -hmm. to have success with this fabulous strategy, I mean, I read it when it came out a couple of years ago, and it's really, it's workable. Peter Drucker, who's a leadership guru, said many years ago that yeah. culture eats strategy for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. So are we going to really deal with this head on, because if we are, then we're going to need to deal with our leadership. So you're saying that we have a negative culture. I'm one not that's saying that it's negative. All right, a, a disrespectful one. Um, in other words, there are issues that there we need to There are issues, we right, have thank issues. You. Thank you. And it's around the globe, but okay. since we're in Jamaica and dealing with the Jamaica, I want to know, are we going to are do something about it? We're going to deal with those cultural right. hindrances. All right, I think we need to have some responses. And um, I will, I will, all right, you really want to, I think they wanted to come up here though because the microphone is not so good on there. So one and two, the film issue. Uh, Victoria, we already spoke earlier and we'll meet before tomorrow. So I'll be in touch with your, you and we can discuss it further. I don't know whether or not uh, Mike or David want to say anything on that. The other thing is the, in relation to the investment, uh, um, the second question, do we have Jampro? And as I gave you my information earlier, if you send me an email, I can put you on to Jampro, who is responsible, the responsible agency for investment in Jamaica and also a facilitator. So that's, a, that's an area that I can address quite, quite simply. The other ones I think are EC, EGC related, so I'll leave those to, to Mike. The issue of um, the, uh, um, a dynamic environment and how you deal with the uh, long-term uh, sustainability of your plans. Yeah, and how do you get involved? And how do you get involved? 
So to, to increase speed, one has to minimize friction and increase horsepower. So we're talking about long-term sustainability. We have to have some long-term plan to minimize the friction as much as possible. Uh, doctor mentioned that Peter Drucker said, uh, culture will eat strategy for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and that is 100% true. So we have a cultural issue that we have to deal with. We have a cultural issue that we have to, we, so we have to re reset and recalibrate expectations, standards. That's where the diaspora can help. Because us in the diaspora, we work with standards, a different standard every day, right? So when we come back to Jamaica, we see the standards that are accepted here, right? Yeah. So our greatest contribution, and this is where we need your help, is to help to reset and recalibrate standards. That's the only way we're going to uh, trump. <laughs> Col uh, the cultural uh, situation that we face. <laughs> OK, so that's your, great, your greatest contribution. Eh? Overcome. overcome, overcome, sorry. <laughs> Fraudulent slip. That's the, so that's your greatest contribution that you can make. And I'll give, you, I'll give you an example, a real life example. In 2002, okay, when, in 1983, I took my first son to register him in school. And when I got to the principal's office, I saw the list of honor rule students. And the majority of them had foreign names. So I thought, oh my gosh, it stuck with me then that immigrants built Canada. Immigrants built Canada. So when in 2002, when we, we took over 75% of the National Commercial Bank, what we, what we inherited then was a culture that was not a sales culture. It was, it was bureaucratic. It was demoralized. It was lethargic. That's what we got. We inherited in 2002. Today, it's the opposite. So what did we? We consciously did the following. We consciously parachuted the equivalent of some immigrants in from head office in Canada to work side by side or staff in Jamaica. To, and that's the only way we could have recalibrated standards of expectations whereby our Jamaican staff would say, oh, I saw it go. So therefore, that's a microcosm of what has to be done in Jamaica. So we, when, so the principle is, whenever you get into second and third generation of anything, you get into complacency. So we saw, and Jamaica is no different. And our lack in Jamaica is we have had a, in effect, by default, uh, not an open immigration policy. So we don't have enough immigrants coming into Jamaica. So the only way we can recalibrate standards is to have a policy whereby we uh, bring more, encourage more immigrants to come to Jamaica. And that is something we're embarking on. That's a long-term sustainable way to do it. And again, the proof of the pudding was in the transformation of NCB. Today, NCB is diametric opposite of what it was when it took it over in, 19, in 2002. As uh, Chairman Jarrett said, it's the largest and most profitable bank in Jamaica. In 2002, when it took it over, it had a 24% market share. Our largest competitor, 54%. Today, it's reversed. NCB has 44%, our largest competitor, 30% and all done with Jamaican hands. <clears throat> so that's this long-term sustainability. We need a different immigration policy to, uh, to, to encourage immigrants to come in here to help us recalibrate and reset and emulate what has been done in every country that has growth, America included. In terms of investments, I was thinking about that before the question was asked. Because if you, leave, if you left 
today without making, doing something affirmative, taking a definitive step. Tomorrow, half-life will set in. What is half-life? Here's what is half-life. Today, you have this much enthusiasm towards, yes, I should be, being, I should be more engaged with Jamaica because there's full great potential in being engaged in Jamaica. It's my country. Yes, this is your enthusiasm right now as we speak today. Tomorrow, you go back home, what will happen? You get into the daily grind of things, your enthusiasm will be this. The next day, you continue the daily grind, you go to back to work, children, wife, husband, right? Your enthusiasm is this. Uh, two weeks later, it's this, towards Jamaica. Three weeks later, it's this. Four weeks later, it's this. That's half life. A month later, you'd have forgotten that you even went to Jamaica, <laughs> right? So the question is, how can we make sure that we make decisions when we have the most information, the most enthusiasm, which is now? So I, would so I would suggest to lock it in. And, and you make decisions when you have the most, right? Not when you have the least a month from now. So you lock it in by doing the following. And I can speak from personal experience. My company has over a billion US dollars invested in Jamaica, or own money, right? So I can speak to per from personal in, uh, experience. When we took the bank over in 2002, it made six million US dollars. This year, in the first nine months, we made 120 million US dollars. In, in, in the first nine months, from six to 120 in nine months. The end of the year is not yet finished. So Jamaica is, as I said, the conditions are right for, to make great in, investments. All of us, diaspora or otherwise, we want to make great investments. We have long-term savings. We're saving for retirement. I would suggest to you that you should allocate 20% of your long-term savings to Jamaica, not just keep it in America, Canada, or England, because you'll get a better return in Jamaica. So if you want to lock in your enthusiasm, eh? Yes. If you, see what, what, if you want to lock in your enthusiasm and make a concrete step to say, yes, I did something, call your broker and say, look, the easiest thing for you to do is say, let me start opening an account, a Jamaican broker, let me open an account, and I want to buy some Jamaican securities. Every business person in Jamaica will tell you, or will tell you this, every Jamaican business person will tell you they, they, will, they, 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 make, they make more money in Jamaica than anywhere else. So you should be investing in Jamaica, and at least 20% of your long-term savings, your retirement savings, so you'll get a better return here than anywhere else in the world. Thank you. You hear it from a practitioner. We've been talking about it. Capri has pointed out the significance of the diaspora to the Jamaican community. Now we have to run like bolt to catch the time. So we're going to start on the left. Hi there. Okay. okay. So I'm Pam um, from Canada, Jamaica. Right. And question? Yeah, question. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so it's a question around um, transparency and corruption. Transparency and corruption. Got to put it out on the table because you're yes. talking about people investing. And so it may be directed at the minister. It could be, um, you know, uh, Michael Lee that speaks to it. I, I leave it uh, for that decision making. As you know, um, there are some changes coming um, in terms of um, the oversight related to uh, corruption and transparency. That's correct. Mm. And so uh, Jamaica's had a history. Uh, many of us in the diaspora, as well as locals, always concerned about that piece. I heard about the bonds. I heard about lots of great things about investing. I want someone to speak to um, really reassure that uh, we are on the right track, that uh, we are uh, really looking to make efforts to, to do some changes. Because as you know, yes. there are some objections uh, to the current legislation uh, you know, that's there. So, Thank you so much. We yes. will put it to the panel, to the right. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Faye Petgrave, and I represent Oops, nursing homes in the southern health region in Jamaica. Yes. I'm here basically to put us on the map. We already interact with the diaspora. Most of us have our residents returning to Jamaica being paid for by their younger relatives who live abroad. Yes, and the question. Uh, 
the question that I have really is more of a if of an ask rather than a question. Right, fast ask. The ask is you put pressure on me, sir. Yes, I, I do. can't move faster. <laughs> <laughs> the ask is that we have the capacity and the talent to actually develop uh, a very important area in our country. Very, we have no interest so far. Yes. And I would like to put us on the map in terms of investment and help with marketing. By marketing, I mean education, promotion, and sales. We already have the talent, we have the capacity, and we'd like to help Jamaica move ahead at a faster rate. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. To the left, doctor. Thank you. Good morning, I'm Dr. Carmen Nicholas. My credentials for standing up here today is that I am the president of the UE Alumni Association, the Florida chapter. I'm also a member of the All Coalition, All Jamaica Alumni uh, um, Associations, as well as members, a member of other professional development organizations in Florida. These organizations make a significant amount of contribution each year yes. in to education, in terms of scholarships, in right. terms of repairs to schools and computers and all kinds of projects. Um, I'd like question. to address my mm -hmm. question to the mm -hmm. researcher. Um, do you have any intentions of looking at the contributions um, that go to education? Thank you. Uh, to the right. Good morning. My name is Barbara Peart. I live in the U.S. officially, but have always invested in Jamaica. Yes. And my little money is in NCB. Yes. <laughs> address, address him. Yes, go ahead, question. So the question is probably cultural and an elephant in the room. I don't think I'll get much argument when I say that women, Jamaican women, have been the bedrock, the foundation of this economy. From yes. our Higglers and our, uh, you know, uh, informal, et cetera, et cetera. And the able so my partners. question yes. is, why aren't more women represented on panels from yesterday to today? All right. Your Thank you. leadership, we've been doing it. Yeah. So that's my question. Thank why you very much. Why aren't we more uh, uh, at the table? Thank you. Thank you so much. Mark. Yes. My, my name is Mark Millward, and uh, I have a few different hats, and uh, one of them is the but one relations question. officer yes. for the National Association of Jamaican and Supportive Organizations. Right. But the most important hat that I have is that I am an engineer, and uh, as an engineer, I'm a master black belt in Lean Six Sigma. Mr. Jared, I know you know what that I is. I know that, yes. Okay. And so Capri Research Institute did a study on creating national wealth using the Jamaica Logistics Hub. And I wanted to know what was the operational activity that was being done to address uh, the findings of that research. I, th I thought the research was excellent. And to get to the, uh, in the arena of competing against Singapore, Rotterdam, and Dubai, uh, that research should be addressed. So I would like some responses on that. That's to Minister Vaz. Yes. I, I believe, was it not uh, uh, Chairman yeah. uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. of the Economic yeah. Growth Council that is uh, heading up the, uh, the oh, is project? Oh, your re research went to the EGC? Yes. Well, okay. Is, is that, who is, uh, who is the chairman that is facilitating that project that, that was announced as a national project for creating national wealth? Job right. creation. Okay, good. We got it. We got it. Thanks, Mark. Uh, we are uh, going to take the responses now, and we're going to close the lines off at the 2 2. So, Dara? I will just address the uh, question as it relates to the corruption and the transparency, and to indicate that today at 2 o'clock we will be discussing that in Parliament as a priority. Today is the last sitting of Parliament before the August recess. Uh, there has been some mention of some concerns in the media in recent days. Those will be addressed and to indicate that we are moving ahead with the single uh, corruption authority, compressing the three into one to make sure that it is 
leaner and meaner as it relates to stamping out corruption. And the other one is women and participation of women. I agree totally, wholeheartedly with the comments that were made that women are the backbone and the bedrock of Jamaican society. We have a minister, Babsy Grange, who stands out as specifically as it relates to the participation of women at the national government board levels and others, and she is the one who really stands up to make sure that the participation of women within government is recognized. Uh, as it relates to representational, that's a, that's, a, that's a personal choice for more women or women to get more involved. There is a great imbalance in the parliamentary, both the lower house and upper house, and it is my wish that a lot of people or women will follow the footsteps of Prime Minister's wife um, and get involved coming from the private sector. So that is something that I think each individual has to make that choice in relation to representational politics. But as far as participation in governance, uh, we are making that also a priority to include more women. Thank you. Can you Yes, so good morning. About the survey question, um, that's what we, you just simply go to um, your general Google search engine and type Jam Valley of Jamaican Diaspora, and that should take you to the survey. Um, you can also contact me. I can disseminate it to anyone that's interested as well. I wanted to speak to the question too about education, speaking about if we'd be looking into the value that these um, alumni associations, most definitely we're currently in dialogue with the University of the West Indies head of the alumni relations as well as at UTEC. Um, as I indicated, a lot of the research to date has been speaking mostly primary information. Just simply reaching out and asking for the cooperation for persons to share this information, I don't know. If it feels very sensitive, it has been proving somewhat difficult for some, so I hope this forum has indicated to persons how valuable this information can be, but we're definitely in the process of identifying the contributions for the education. We definitely know that that is significant. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mike, what, what is the question? This was on the logistics and the nice. operational we, we efficiency. Yeah, yeah. So the question is, where does the uh, logistics hub stand? As, as a question. The, the Prime Minister about two months ago designated the International Logistics Hub as a national project. And the reason why it was designated a national project is because if you think about Jamaica's location, Jamaica's location is uh, primary, the primary location in the world for an international hub, right? If you think about Jamaica's time zone, perfect. If you think about the British, the, the, the legal framework that Jamaica operates under, it's British, it's international. So we have location, we have time zone, we have uh, legal framework, and we have language. So it's, we should be the Singapore of the Western Hemisphere, but we are not. So, so therein lies the potential. So in January of last, of this year, uh, the, the, the Prime Minister led an emissary to, in, to Israel. Uh, David was, uh, and myself were present. And with that in mind, uh, and making sure that we don't lose the opportunity to build out this international logistics hub once and for all, and do it right. And based on a philosophy that I have, that if you want to be successful at anything, any endeavor. There's a three-step formula. Number one, you identify a role model. You want to be successful at teaching, being a student, or building the best international logistics, logistics hub. It, identify a role model. Who has done it eminently successful before me? Number two, get the recipe from the role model. And number three, do the same. Don't change it. <laughs> So based on that formula, we thought, you know what? We need someone who has 
the experience of doing this. And we brought back a gentleman from India who was the former Minister of, uh, uh, Minister of uh, Infrastructure in, in, of, of, in Israel. His name is Gidon Sitterman. He was in charge of all roads, all toll bridges, all ports, airport and uh, otherwise, and he's now working with us. He's our consultant. And he has given us access to his entire network. So recently, uh, the, the, the president of the Port Authority of Jamaica, Professor Gordon Shirley, uh, went to Rotterdam. Rotterdam is one of the largest international logistics hubs in the world, and he was given total access. Uh, we, presently, there is a, an emissary to Singapore, uh, again, role model, re get the recipe, and we'll do the same. So this is a, an important national objective, and we're going to make sure that it is brought home this time once and for all. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. Uh, in real, we're going to take four. There are four. I counted four earlier. So one, two, three, four persons. So Delia, Hello. first. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Delia Walker Huntington, and I'm a Jamaican living in South Florida. Question. Um, one of the issues uh, that we have here is inviting us to come to invest in Jamaica is something that's natural for a lot of us. But the problem, the barrier, something the lady hinted at earlier, indiscipline. And she mentioned that we were, we were subjected to it yesterday. We had someone mm -hmm. here mm -hmm. for an hour and a half who spoke ignoring everybody else on the panel Thank you. and ignoring the rest of us and what we had to do. And that's from leadership. Right. And so if we are going to address and encourage us living overseas 20, yeah. 30, 40 years to yeah. come back, the indiscipline, indiscipline that starts at the top right. has to be addressed. Okay. Mr. Uh, Panton, we're, we're, you... We're, we're, we're going to try and do it right this time. Quickly. So quickly. Yeah. Mr. Panton, you spoke about uh, establishing a, a, a list of Jamaicans with expertise Gloria. overseas mm -hmm. um, to help Jamaica. My request is that it works both ways. A diaspora relationship has to be symbiotic. If Jamaica is looking for experts, um, they need to look to the diaspora for paid positions. Many of us volunteer and give our times. But when there's money for paid opportunities, you need to look to us first. All right, thank you, thank you. Question? I also have to make a statement, because it was made by this team, I can reach in that. Um, we're looking for foreigners. However, we have the intellectual property right here in Quest, our own name, country name. and uh, here abroad yes, within yes. the diaspora. So let's tap our own before mm -hmm. we're going overseas. Take the recipe, yes, yes, but develop and utilize it by your own Jamaicans. Thank Question you. is: A name, a name, a <laughs> name. Are we looking? A name. Into, oh, sorry, Eva Blackburn. My apologies, Canada. Have we clarified or looked into the fact that, for myself, Canadian, locked in RSPs being utilized to buy the funds or invest in the stock exchange? Because last diaspora, that question was asked, we could not. That is an abundance of resources that could be utilized, because right now I buy everything from the NASDAQ, TSX, why can I not buy from here? So we need to look into that. You have a whole wealth of money that's not. You, uh, that, is, that, that would be the easiest way to access for, for long-term savings, to access Jamaican securities. So it's a very timely question because exactly right now, as we speak, there is dialogue between my firm in Canada, which is a securities dealer, and uh, the Jamaica Stock Exchange to have some, uh, to, to make sure that the, the stocks in Canada, in Jamaica, will be recognized. Because that's right? now four uh, years waiting. That's no, no, but it is, it is, it, there, it, it has started. Okay. Right? And we, we are hyper. We want to get it done. So, very timely question. It's in train. Okay, thanks, Michael. And there's a special session on Wednesday, which we'll be doing with the Stock Exchange. And I believe there's a visit to the Stock Exchange. Question on the left. Yes, morning. Suzette Rochester Lord, representing Victoria Mutual Brand in Florida. Question Why is it taking so long when there's a probate of will okay. for that to be done, issued? Okay. 
Another thing is that with the increase in crime mm. and murder, visitors' arrival to Jamaica is one of my greatest concerns in pushing my business where customers can come in and purchase properties. Why is it that now there is a change in management when there are so many great things happening regarding the tourism sector? Thank you. To the right. Uh, good morning. My name is Courtney Corey uh, with Canada. Good, good question. Um, real quickly, sir. Um, to the lady, what she said earlier about the speech yesterday from the minister, personally, I, I, I admire his approach. He was frank, he was candid. I had no issues with that. I don't want to start a war. Respect your position on that. Secondly, um, my question is a personal nature, self serving. Um, the prime minister has mentioned he wanted to look at real estate and home ownership as part of the economic growth and prosperity agenda. For myself, I want to know what would that look like? What does that mean? We own a few properties in Montego Bay and Westmoreland, so I'm trying to learn how can we participate and how can we also benefit from that approach. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I'll take the fifth one, the last one. Very, very quickly, please. Right, thank you. My name is Jackie Watson. I'm the president of the Caribbean American Chamber of Commerce of Georgia. Thank My you. question is, um, there was a lot of great information that was put out today. I wanted to know, if, are there any plans on going um, around to various cities and speaking to Jamaican and Caribbean organization in the various diasporas? Thank you, thank you. All right, okay, so we, we start with, um, uh, I guess, with the paid, paying Jamaicans to, identifying Jamaicans to serve and to act as consultants for paid service and so on. You know, there's a song a long time in, uh, ago called, um, what a nice place to live, sweet jam dung. Only problem is, dollars now run. So I agree, dollars now run. I would like them to run some more. To the extent I have any influence, Ms. Dahlia, I would be very happy to utilize that influence. Um, I am purely a volunteer in my act activities. Um, but, to the, but I do agree with you that I've come across some very impressive persons in the diaspora who, you know, deserve to be, to be compensated, and I will do what I can to help facilitate that. In, um, indeed, there are other w mechanisms as well, like boards of director positions, etc., and it is certainly something that I will we'll focus on, and I know that Mr. Leachin is also committed to that. Uh, in terms of this last question of visiting the diaspora, excellent question, Jackie, and I totally agree with it. I will say that the Prime Minister himself, I met with him yesterday, he's off to Singapore, he left to Singapore uh, last night, but he has indicated that he would like to do more meeting with the diaspora uh, in, uh, you know, in the United States, in Canada, and he's actually putting together a schedule to visit various uh, parts of various cities in the United States, Canada, and the UK over the next six to eight months, and he's working very closely with JamPro on that. So I do know that he has a commitment to that. I have been helping out in various areas, and, and I do think it is the right thing to do. Let me just say on this last point about indiscipline and people talking down, I'm very glad that the, um, the person said what he said. I agree that there's a lot of indiscipline and a lot of disrespect in the society, and it's certainly something that needs to be addressed. Um, at the same time, I think we should all be, as, that, as the gentleman said, we should really appreciate that different people communicate in different ways, and that not all of us uh, can meet the standards that you set for yourselves. And I think we should be open-minded in listening to others, particularly those who you know have made a commitment and sacrifice for our country. So that's all. Yeah. I just want to, as we as we wrap up, Victoria Royal has questions about getting commitment from investments in Jamaica. I believe the question was answered differently. In other words, there's a stock exchange that we can talk to, NCB Capital Market, Jane Fund Managers, Victoria Mutual, you have various financial institutions that could work with you to create a way in which to raise the capital, but it would have to be in a structured way with a proper business plan. Investors want to see what's the return that will, they will get from it. In relation to the issue of um, probate of wills, that was a matter I think that went to the EGC in terms of the amount of capital that will, it would release. Uh, we have uh, Melrose Reed here, who is an attorney who will quickly tell us about the problem. Very, very quickly. Melrose. Good morning, members of the diaspora. I, um, I just heard the question and I, an attorney in Jamaica, I thought I could give a brief response. Um, probate in Jamaica takes about one year to, com to be completed. 
quite often the probates that we get from the US, Canada, England, and other places are persons who have died for say 40 years or more, quite a long time. There is estate duties to be paid, you have to do a valuation of the property. So when someone calls to say, I want a property to be probated, it's not as just getting up and say one, two, three. Sometimes the will is so defaced, you can't find the witnesses at all who had witnessed the will, and now the government has instituted what is called an estate duty. So the dead person has to get a TRN number for the estate, yes, a dead person. And even if the person had a TRN number, you have to get a new TRN number for the estate. In addition to that, many of the persons who are applying for probate with the children of the deceased, they are living abroad for years. For you to do any business in Jamaica, you have to have TRN numbers. So you have to get the TRN number for the persons who are applying for the estate, TRN number for the dead person, and a lot of issues. So the issue is that, it, and the court system also, as we don't want to go there, it is short-staffed. But if we have all the relevant documents and everything come into place, then the will can be probated in a year or less. Thank you. Thanks for that. Thanks for that. Um, I know we, we tend to like the spirit world in Jamaica, but boy, getting a TRN for the for the dead is, is a new one. Um, listen, we're at the end. We had a great session. We had some great information. Michael Leachin, through his words and his example, has demonstrated that we can invest in Jamaica. We can make a difference. Some key words from his presentation. Economic growth is the center of it all. Without economic growth, no, no schooling, no health, crime, social dislocation. It's important that becomes a factor. From 1850 to, to, to now, Jamaica has struggled with growth. 1832 to 1930, average growth rate 2.5%. So this is not something that was developed only the last few years. The 60s was the shortest period of real growth. And so it's a century old problem. So it's gonna take a, a while for the psyche to change, Mike. And you're quite right. The whole issue of creating an environment where we have lots of people coming into the country even persons from the diaspora. Anybody who lives in Mandeville will understand that the diaspora are different. In other words, if your lawn gets out of line, the Jamaicans from England are gonna tell you to cut your hedges and to clean up the place. It's a different set of values, and that applies to business as well. David spoke to what the EGC task force is about. Some important points. The idea of an immigration card for Jamaicans is important. It gives you the right to stay. The immigration officer won't give you two weeks to stay. When you come and your passport says born in Jamaica, but it's an American passport, you get 10 days to stay in Jamaica. It's a big issue. In India, you're able to conduct certain kinds of business except voting in that country once you're a person of Indian descent. And the idea of repurposing the, the foundation to capture the participation of a broader set of the community overseas is a very good one. And we look forward to David's leadership of that role going forward. And it's good to see that through the EGC, we are now getting more Jamaicans who are in the diaspora beginning to participate. So the question was asked, how do we get involved? Be like David, step forward, um, just like going to church, step forward, be counted, you're involved, just like that. We got the numbers today, which is very good. An idea as to what's the value of the diaspora. I'm almost thinking that you need a ministry of the diaspora, given that this thing is so huge. And maybe, maybe now that, maybe now that, maybe now that Michael has the information and he has the power to get things in the IMF agreement as we have seen, he can probably somehow get this area to be properly addressed. What gets counted and measured gets some results and today we have an indication of the measurement. I want to thank everybody for being here today and for those whose questions were not fully answered, we will answer them in the course of time. So thank you all for coming. We're going to go on our two minutes. Um, we want to now go on our break. Um, we, we're supposed to finish at 10.15. We're behind time, but the break, the break time hasn't shortened. So we're going to come back here at, mm -hmm, 
at, shall we say, it's now 1047, shall we say, we get back here by 11 o'clock to carry on with the rest of the session. I believe Najaso wants to hand the book to Michael Leachin. Najaso, come up here quickly. Mike, what's that? You have one word to say, yeah. or no words. No words to say, no words to say. Moderator, Mr. Earl. No, Mike, want to observe us. Moderator, Mr. Earl Jarrett, wrapping up that first session on day two of the Jamaica 55 Diaspora Conference here at the Jamaica Conference Center in downtown Kingston. We heard from a number of persons, including Michael Lee Chin, chairman of the Economic Growth Council. Yes. We heard from Dr. David Panton, mm -hmm. a member of the Economic Growth Council Diaspora Task Force, and we heard from Shanique Smart, research officer at Capri. We also heard from our minister, Mr. Daryl Vaz. Absolutely. And especially that last presentation presented some very interesting um, valuation, the, the, the figures that gave us some idea of the contribution of the diaspora to the Jamaican society and economy. I was making some notes, Theo, and we learned that the diaspora contributes about 23% to the Jamaican economy, and there's the potential for that to grow to 35%, which is why we had this forum here to see how best we can get persons in the diaspora to contribute more to Jamaica's economic growth. And that percentage is of the GDP. Yes. Right, right, right. And just for those of us who are watching us on uh, Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, we'd love to know where you're from. Uh, so please, comment in the country that you're from and uh, any other information you'd like to share with us. We, we'd love to hear from you so we can interact with you. Though you're not here, you're still a part of us and you're still a part of the diaspora at large if you're outside Jamaica. And if you're watching from here at home, please feel free to comment the parish that you are watching from. That's the theme of the conference, Lorraine. Partnering, Partnering for, for growth. growth. Absolutely. We have an interview coming up uh, with Miss Maria Kellier. And we're going to go to that right now. And I believe we have another interview afterwards as the coffee break goes on for a few minutes. So keep watching. We love having you here. Absolutely. We do. Okay. Uh, all right, I am here with Miss Maria Kellier. And during the session this morning, she asked a very interesting question about investing in Jamaica. And I'd like to know a little bit more about your interest in investing in Jamaica, Miss Kellier. Um, well, first of all, just being here is, is an investment in Jamaica. Yes. And um, absolutely, all the, the potential that's in Jamaica we also we find that there are many times when you just don't know exactly what to invest in. And so my question really was, was to get a little bit more direction in terms of what are the, what are the, 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 the items that you can invest in. Right, is right. it property? Mm -hmm. Is it investing in banks? Is it investing in education? Because a lot of times we come down and we really are coming to kind of see you know, what it is. What is Most there? times we get a lot of general Mm -hmm. information but nothing specific and so my particular interest is I have some property that I really want to develop in Jamaica right, right I have also some social capital that I want to invest in Jamaica in terms of my uh, my profession in terms of mm -hmm. my skill sets that I think would be valuable assets in Jamaica yes. and so investment can be on different levels you know different areas of investment which may come from the same person right right and right so sometimes you just need a little bit more guidance or a little more specific information not so much guidance but specific information in uh, because most time we're here for a short time yes and we want to make the best of our time i, I noticed you started smiling when you spoke about the social investments yes, and the property <laughs> seems like some great plans are afoot yeah i have some property i want to make what i'm calling right now an arts village and I have some seaside property in uh, Hopewell. 
And I think this would be a great um, piece of property to develop the arts and to have the arts be um, part of the social fabric of, uh, of that particular community, yes. which is short on um, industries. Okay. And so I want to bring down um, professional artists and um, uh, investment people and you know, people who can actually invest in that particular community. Right, because right. I believe that if each community in Jamaica is strong, then mm -hmm. obviously Jamaica, Jamaica is, is strong. strong. Absolutely. And so, uh, uh, and, and a lot of time, we, the, what they call soft um, investment, which mm -hmm. to me is not really soft because that's my life. Absolutely. <laughs> my life I is the creativity. Right now, there's a lot of buzz around the creative industry. Right, And right. tomorrow, there's going to be a panel, so I plan to be there with bells on, you know, to kind of find out what Jamaica is doing. I know there's, they're doing a lot of stuff, but I want to kind of bring that together in my own mind and then yeah. see how my particular contribution, my particular investment can be um, effective. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Miss Maria Kellier, for it's joining Marie us. Marie Kellier. Marie Kellier. Uh -huh. All, right. All right. Well, I got, so it, I've got it right me. now. All right. Yes, man. So and, and we look forward to you and the bells tomorrow Thank you. All right. as well. Uh -huh. uh, we had Miss Marie Kellier joining us for an interview, telling us about her interest in investing in Jamaica. And she, in particular, mentioned the arts, uh, which is a big part of the Diaspora Conference. Uh, during the marketplace. If you walk around outside, there's a uh, art expo and all of that. We have another interview coming up and uh, Lorraine will handle that one. And I'm told I have to keep it here. one of Jamaica's future leaders. She is the Youth Minister of Justice in the Jamaica Youth Parliament. She is the General Secretary of the Jamaica Union of Tertiary Students. And she also does some work at the Portmore Youth Information Center. Sunil, welcome. Thank you. All right, so yesterday you, worked, you mentioned your concern about youth investment and investment in the development of our young people yes. and the issue that we have some children who are obviously displaying behavioral issues but it seems as if nothing is being done to steer them on a better path. Now tell me what role do you think members of the diaspora can play in greater youth development in Jamaica? Well just to tweak that a bit, the issue is that I don't feel that enough is being done. I wouldn't want to believe or perpetuate that there's nothing being done, but I feel that enough isn't being done. And in terms of how the diaspora can help, a quick scenario, there's, I attended St. Jago, and there's a past student, his name is Louis Grant, he's the vice president at, at Irijam in New York. What he does is that he comes down every year as much as possible, and he comes and he have meetings with students at St. Jago, whether students, athletes, academias, students of St. Jago. And what he does, he finds a way to create programs that are geared at their development. Not to only give off money or give off his time, but to ensure that there is a level of consistency that will impact the behavior and change the behavior. In terms of Jamaica, I feel that persons in the diaspora can do a similar thing. You don't have, if each person or a group of persons from different schools do a similar thing, they will be impacting the nation's schools. And so I feel that those who are here though have to begin to highlight these issues to persons in the diaspora who may not be here to feel the issues and see what the real issues are. So I feel if that is done, proper investment is done in those youth, we are going to have serious changes, good changes. All right, and as a member of the youth parliament, as one of those young people who we can say a future leader, 
what would you like to see more young people like yourself doing in terms of contributing to Jamaica's development? Well, I've always said it. I even said it this morning in a post on Instagram that it doesn't matter what it is, it doesn't matter how minute it is, it doesn't matter how small it is. You can do something. I like to see young people move away from the idea that my country owes me something. My country must do this for me and the government must do that for me. The reality is we're all assets of Jamaica and we all have to make Jamaica work for us. I don't think the responsibility rests on any one person, any one government to make Jamaica better. It is all of us. And so for young persons who may ask me sometimes, oh, Sineen, I don't get the opportunities that you do. It doesn't really matter. You can do very small things, go to a home, go to a church to, you know, have sessions with the young people in the church. Quite a few persons, um, well, the reality is a lot of young persons do not know how to construct a proper resume, don't know how to conduct a proper interview. And so I feel that if those persons who have that knowledge can at least speak to a group of five persons and help them master those two things, that would have been you creating a major impact in doing something that many may consider small. And this information in terms of constructing a proper resume and so on, this information would be available at the, the youth information centers, right? Yes. All right, so we're looking, you will be participating in the youth forum at this diaspora conference. Yes, I will. So we're looking forward to hearing from you and to hearing from you throughout the rest of this conference. Yes, definitely. Thank you for coming. Thank you. That was Sunil Smith. She is the Youth Minister of Justice in Jamaica's Youth Parliament, which was restarted this year. She is also the General Secretary of the Jamaica Union of Tertiary Students. Thank you so much. So we are on the coffee break now and awaiting the start of the second session, which will feature presentations and a discussion on a number of topics, including future strategies for expanding the outsourcing sector. We'll hear about building Jamaica as a key global logistics hub, strategies for attracting global investors and so on. So that's something that we are hoping that you will stick around with us for. And I was making some notes in terms of some important websites that can assist Jamaicans in the diaspora who want to know more about what's happening here at home and who want to make a greater contribution. One of them is callingalljamaicans.org and this is actually where the diaspora survey can be found. It's still going on the value of the Jamaican diaspora survey. So we're inviting persons to go to that website callingalljamaicans.org where you can find out more and you can actually contribute to that survey. There is also Jampro, which is the lead in terms of investment in Jamaica. Their website is jamaicatradeandinvest.org. So we invite you to stay with us as we continue to stream live from the Jamaica 55 Diaspora Conference here at the Jamaica Conference Center in downtown Kingston.